attend who art in We've been talking about the reality of God the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this session, we're going to focus on God the Father. The hymn we just heard describes God as everlasting Father, everlasting God. In Ephesians 3.15, St. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom all fatherhood all patria is named both in heaven and on earth. And this comes to full fruition in the life and words of Jesus Himself. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the Lord's Prayer. And in that special, unique word that Jesus applies to God, Abba, our heavenly Abba, a word of familial intimacy, that Jesus picks out of the culture of His day and gives to us as a precious gift, a title to ascribe to our Heavenly Father. Unsurprisingly, the opening of the Creed deals with what Christians believe about God the Father. What the Creeds try to do is to give a summary of the main Christian ideas about who God is. Who can define God? Our minds are so small. All that we understand, we understand in terms of our own world, limited by time and space and our humanity. We use images like Father or, or what have you um, as a means to try to get a handle on the reality of God. Of course, we can't do that. We cannot encompass God within any human frame of reference or any system of, uh, of symbols. People in every age, in every place, they seek for something beyond themselves. Augustine talked about our hearts being restless until they find their rest in God. And that is a human longing uh, for the great mind, the great power, someone, something beyond ourselves. Now the Bible never tries to prove that there is a God. The Bible presupposes two things. There is a God and God reveals himself. And those two presuppositions are enormously important. God comes to us. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. That's the way the Bible begins. And then God reveals himself to us. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh, pitched his tent among us. We behold his glory. This is the biblical God. He is and he reveals himself. I like to think of it as the speaking God. He's the one who communicates. He doesn't leave us in the silence of the universe. You look out on a starry night, it is beautiful, but it, the vast reaches of space can seem cold and empty. Out of the silence, God speaks to us, the speaking God. God reveals himself to be supreme over all others, so supreme that he is solitary. I only am the Lord, the prophet Isaiah says regularly. The ancient world believed, as many still to do, in lots of gods populating the world. Uh, that's called polytheism, many gods. Some in the ancient world, as still in some parts of our world today, believed in pantheism, that God indwelt creation. But this very distinctive belief says, first of all, that God is one. Secondly, that he is over against creation. Uh, he is the creator, but he's not sucked into creation. He is a distinct being in his own right. That he is almighty and supreme and reigns sovereignly in the world that he has made. It's right that we should remember that God is our creator. Right that we should remember that he is almighty, but that just as when we pray, we say our Father, so when we declare our faith, we begin by saying that the God we worship 
is our Father. The statement, uh, you know, I believe in God the Father, could be amplified or illustrated by the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus teaches us to pray, Our Father. It gives a frame of reference for understanding, I believe in God the Father. The first word of the Lord's Prayer, Our, is transformative in and of itself, because it indicates that we enter into relationship with God in the context of our relationships with every other person in our life. The nearest, closest relationships to the most casual, the most distant, the most one, perhaps once in a lifetime relationship, that every other person is somehow caught up in that word our. When we approach God with the word our, we, we are not approaching God in some sort of privatized, individualized, Western kind of Christianity, but rather we are, we are approaching God in the context of, of the human community of which we are a part, in its broadest sense as well as in its closest sense. Then when, when we continue the prayer, Our Father, that conditions the nature of those relationships with the Our, because that states that the other person in the Our is our brother or our sister, that we have a common parent, that we are united at the deepest levels of our being in our relationship with God. When we speak of God as our Father, or I believe in God the Father, we are also making a statement about the nature of our relationship with our fellow human beings, that they are in some mysterious sense our brothers and our sisters. We begin with, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. And this word Father, I think, is very important. To say that God is Father is an amazing claim, which has all sorts of practical implications in our lives. We don't believe that the world is run by an impersonal force. We don't believe that it's the outworking of just uh, physics or astrophysics. Uh, we don't believe that fate rules our lives. We don't believe that the stars govern our lives. We believe that there is a personal God who made us and who loves us, who is in charge of our lives. Amazingly, this God of awesome power can also be referred to as Father. That means two things in particular. We call him Father because he is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we call him Father because he is also father of the universe and father of the whole human race. The question is often asked, aren't we all sons of God? So in what sense is Jesus uh, a unique son of God? It's interesting as you read the Gospels that uh, the words are very careful to distinguish his relationship as a son of God and our relationship as sons or daughters of God. There is indeed a very important sense in which we are all of us sons of God. But in our case, it means we become sons of God through participating in God's grace, in his glory. But when we say Jesus is the only son of God, we are assigning to him a unique position. We are saying, in effect, that he is God by nature. We share in the divine life by grace, but he is God. So at the end of uh, 
the resurrection appearances as he uh, speaks to his disciples. He talks about going to my father and to your father, and he distinguishes the relationship he has with God the Father from the relationship that we have as God the Father. There are some people who would say that the difference between Jesus and us is merely one of degree, that we are all sons and daughters of God. It just so happened that Jesus was closer to God, it just so happened that he was fuller of the Spirit, that he was more obedient, but that we all have the potential for that. I don't believe that that's what the Bible teaches and uh, that that can in fact be a very dangerous uh, doctrine. Each of us is a son. He is the son. We are called to become sons in the son, if you like. We are called to share by grace in what he is by nature. What the Bible teaches is first of all that Jesus is unique uh, and it does it by telling us about the virgin birth, the unique origin of Christ, by talking about his sinless life, and indeed about his very close intimacy with God and perfect fit with God throughout all that he did in a way that is never your experience or mine. Because by comparison, you and I have human parents not born of the Virgin Mary and of the Holy Spirit, and we are tainted from birth with sin. Uh, we do not live that sinless life that he did, uh, and we need the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit to cause us not only to be born, but to be born again, so that we become not just sons and daughters of God because we're created by him, but sons and daughters of God because we are born anew by the Spirit in him, and that's what makes the difference. St. Paul uses the image of adoption to try and explain this. He says, look, in an ordinary human family, you have a natural son, and then you have others that are brought in by adoption. They weren't born into this family, but they are chosen. They are invited to become part of it. They share the same privileges as the natural son. That's what Paul is saying to all of us. We are adopted by grace. By that he means we have no claim on this relationship, but rather in his graciousness, God invites us to become part of his family and to share this same relationship with him. When we're born anew, born for a second time, then our relationship with God alters, and then we have the gift of the Holy Spirit and the capacity to begin to be Christ-like in our characters, uh, which before we would find very difficult. So in this word, Father, we are expressing both the relationship of Jesus as Son to his Father, but also our relationship. It's reminding us that God is the one who brings us into being. And more than that, that God as Father is one who cares for us, as, for example, an earthly father would care about his children. So the idea of God as Father is immediately setting up this idea of a God who can not simply be trusted, but a God who can be known in a personal way. He is not so distant as to be removed, uh, but we have this amazing privilege of believing in the one God that is at the centre of our universe, the Lord God of the universe, whom we can know as children and relate to. Uh, intimately. As a father, God is not distant. There were many theologies and philosophical currents floating around throughout Christianity, ancient as well as medieval, that made God remote. There was even a point at which it, in the 13th century there were some philosophies that argued that God could not know individual events and individual things, that he didn't have contact with the earthly, historical, bodily, material world in which I live. That was condemned in 1270 and again in 1277 because what was affirmed is that God is intimately connected to the world in which I live. That the incarnation means that God entered history. The crucifixion means that God gave his son for the world and that God's providence knows 
every event and every course of history throughout all of, of, of the Earth's history, that God is near us. There are plenty of belief systems in the world where the idea of God as Father seems really quite remote. And can't, they can't understand it. They can't take it in. It's not even part of their beliefs. And that God is benevolent and forgiving so that the, the nearness of, of, of God in Christ to the believer, to history, was always affirmed through the Incarnation, through the Resurrection, and through our unity to Christ by means of the Spirit. With the Christian scriptures, with the Old Testament scriptures as well, uh, it's there from the very early days. So, so Abraham knew that, in the sense of God being the Father, and uh, also the nation of Israel, the people of God, knew that God was their Father, guiding them, caring for them, leading them through the wilderness, through the difficult times. The first time in the Old Testament that we discover God being called Father, it's actually said the other way around. God says to Pharaoh in Egypt, Israel is my son, my firstborn, therefore let my people go that they may serve me. And then often looking back from uh, later perspectives, the Jews look back at that time and say, surely you are our father. So the idea of God's fatherhood in the book of Exodus is very closely bound up with the fact that God has been secretly nurturing this family all along, and now it's time to act. They believed, because Moses came back from the desert with this message, that God was their father in this sense, that the one who'd made the world and was in covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their ancestors, had now heard them in distress, crying for help, and was coming to rescue them. So then when Jesus gave his followers this prayer, which we call the Lord's Prayer, beginning, Our Father, and when he himself prayed to God as Abba, Father, that's probably the main thing he's going back to. The sense is that now is the time for God to act. You know, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, what God did for the children of Israel in Egypt is like what he's now doing for you and for the whole world, only now it's going to be much more so. So rediscovering that God is Father is a way of saying we're rediscovering that great tradition which says when God's people and the whole world are in distress, God is going to come to the rescue. That's pretty central to the whole thing. Then again, developing out of various Old Testament passages, we see the idea of Father both as creator and as nurturer, as the one who brings his people up. Um, some lovely passages um, in the Old Testament which speak of, yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. This picture of the father teaching the little boy to walk and then grieving that the boy then rebels against him when he grows up. And so it's deep rooted in the Old Testament, but we then find it in the New when Jesus says, um, listen, if you ask your father for bread, is he going to give you a stone? If you ask him for fish, is he going to give you a snake? And he said, well, even you, evil as you are, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So there's that strong sense of fatherhood, meaning the one who will provide and provide wisely and provide wisely for those who ask him and acknowledge him and call upon him. That doesn't mean that God is going to become some sort of a celestial Santa Claus that, that gives us what we want. Uh, what we want and what we need sometimes are two very different things, but that God is sufficient to sustain us. The father of a family is responsible for the care of that family, and particularly the parents are responsible for the children through their growing years. And we are saying that our relationship to God is like that. We are his dependent children, and he is our caring father, and there is a relationship not only of dependence but of love between the two of us. The word love does not actually come in the creed. The creed is very brief, but if you speak of a father, you speak of a God of love. This surely is the characteristic of a human father, that he loves his children and his children love him. So God is Father, but not Father as so many people today think of Father, coming from broken homes, abusive fathers, but of all that is best in fatherhood, that is enshrined in the term 
Father. God is Father. Though our human experience of fathers may be tainted, uh, may be disappointing, as many of us had great fathers, uh, but not all have experienced good fatherhood humanly. We shouldn't project our human experience of fatherhood onto God, but rather understand God is the unique, brilliant, ultimate, excellent model of fatherhood. It's not as though we've created God in the image of our fathers. On the contrary, the idea is that true fatherhood is a reflection of the fatherhood of God. God who is loving, caring, compassionate, all those things that we would want our fathers to be, and yet many people would have to say, my father wasn't like that. But when I look to God, I come to God the Father, and I find there somebody who does understand me because he made me. He understands me because he even knows my thoughts. He knows my thoughts from afar off, as the Old Testament scripture says. That's a wonderful thought, that he actually knows not merely what I look like, not merely how I feel, but he knows my very thoughts. So we see the ancient Jewish idea being developed in a variety of ways by Jesus himself. Here we have Jesus, Son of God, teaching us to pray. When you pray, say, Father, our Father. And uh, the term he uses is a very warm term. You could almost translate it, Daddy. Just as a child calls out in the night, as my kids called out, Daddy, Daddy, in the night, Jesus said, when you pray, say, Daddy. It is such a warm term, such a beautiful term. The term Abba Father could only be uttered by the believer because only the believer could perceive that God was a father, that God was benevolent, that God was near us, that God was involved in our world, and that God was a redeemer. And that means he instructs, he guides, he provides, he cares, he corrects, he disciplines, and ultimately he has authority over us, all within a very personal, intimate relationship. As Galatians says, that I am a child, or as Romans and Galatians both say, an heir. But for me to be a child of God, if God's a father, I'm God's child. But it's understood that I am not in the right relationship with my father, that I am a sinner, and that as a sinner, my back is turned to God. No matter what I do, I may be virtuous, I may be unvirtuous, I may be an obvious rebel, I may be a perfectly good citizen, but I am alienated from God. My everything that I do, because I am born in sin, and I repeat sins throughout my life, that my life is directed away from God. And I constantly am seeking happiness, fulfillment, whatever, but I'm seeking it in, the, in a direction opposed to God. And so to be a child of God means that you recognize that you have to turn around. Now, grace turns you around towards God. And then the benevolence of God becomes apparent because then you recognize that your true destiny is with this Father through whom you will be saved. And that you will, the, the, earth, the life that you lead on earth turned away from God is a long life of wandering, of stumbling, of yearning. But even the life turned towards God is still a life where, as Augustine would say, you're on a pilgrimage. You're on earth, you're on a pilgrimage towards the heavenly Jerusalem. But it's very clear from, from Augustine's confessions, from many, many texts, that the resting in God is the only real rest you have. So that without being the child of God, you will always be restless, wandering, unfulfilled, and unhappy. You will keep seeking objects to fulfill you. But the rest that you seek, 
the fulfillment, the blessedness that you seek can only be had as a child of God, which through grace you are turned towards God, and when you are united with God, you are at the ultimate point of blessedness and rest. Writing to the believers in Galatia, St. Paul said, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so we're no longer slaves, but we are sons and daughters. And if precious sons and daughters, then we also are heirs of God, heirs of God the Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I invite you now to enter into this relationship with God the Father, through Jesus Christ His Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as Paul gives this beautiful benediction in the book of Philemon 3, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.